Hello, it's Scott Manley here with episode 13. Oh my god, lucky 13. I hope we are not going to have any more crazy incidents like we've had in episodes 11 and 12. In fact, I am for episode 13 to be rather mundane and boring, but it is going to be fairly long, even though most of this is going to be played at four times normal rate. Now, the Keithane Miner is on the surface and has been fully self-sustaining. With the addition of that little fuel tank on the front, we can actually refine fuel into that tank and then transfer it out to those external engines, meaning that we don't have to worry about rescuing it again. At least, assuming it has enough Delta V to get into orbit. Now, we're going to use... We're using uh, the Mechanical Jeb readouts here. We're not actually having Mechanical Jeb fly it. We're just going to basically get up to orbital velocity and then we're using the, the display, the rendezvous display, that tells us how close we're going to get, and of course the rendezvous display is way more accurate than the display provided by the the orbital information screen, the map screen. Uh, it lets us, you know, tweak our velocity and see what works better uh, to get our relative approach distance down to a much, much finer margin than would otherwise be afforded to us. So I like the extra instrumentation. But yeah, we're just going to try and get that down, get it as close as possible. And, I, you know, I'd like to say that I have some good advice on how to do this, but uh, I don't. It's kind of just a... I don't know. I, it's just something essentially learned, you know, flying by the seat of my pants, more or less. Uh, estimating where the thing will be. You see that that was on a different inclination there. And we're just going to align the orbits using mechanical jab. That is one thing I'm being lazy with. <laughs> I mean, the idea here is that this is going to be a rather mundane day-to-day, uh, -day, you know, system. Uh, we've already tried the the landing system, and unfortunately, we found out that that doesn't work for landing at a specific coordinate. It's fine. Uh, if we fly it manually and then we can switch the autopilot for the, the last, you know, 20 meters or so to make sure that we land down safely. But we're st having to do almost all of the flying manually, unfortunately. Uh, or fortunately. I don't know. It'd be really nice to be able to click it, have it fly up and dock because this thing is only going to carry a certain amount of keythane, and we're, we're limited in our vehicle size by how much we could launch from the planet Kerbin using our reusable launcher. Um, but if you looked at the, the designs, keythane has a, a density that's one-fifth of regular fuel. So basically you get a five-to-one conversion of keythane into regular fuel. Which means that giant tank doesn't actually give us nearly as much as it would imply. Also, the little converter uh, has like only a 70% efficiency. So we're going to get in and convert this and we'll be lucky to fill half a tank uh, after we've dealt with everything else. But anyway, we're going to go in. It's nice we have this extra long docking node here. This is our, our docking proboscis or something. I don't know. We should probably go in and switch that giant spider, you know, the sky crane, switch it to the other end of the station, because it's really making it hard to get in at these docking nodes. Um, yeah, one of these days I'll remember to do that. I've certainly got a whole lot better at manually aligning these things. Um, you know, for you know, Previously I was using the nav ball for everything, but as everything, as nothing wants to stay exactly on the nav ball, through necessity, I've had to really learn to manually align these things. And that, that's fine. I'm, I guess I'm getting there, getting a little more, a little more proficient at this thing. But there we are. You see, if we, if it wasn't for that docking proboscis, docking, you know, corridor, you know, you'd be getting very close to that engine there, and I'm not sure it would be the safest. Uh, Safe it's system. I, if I have to bring anything else in, I'm definitely going to have to switch the sky crane over to the other side. Oh my god, look at that whole thing wobbling about like a giant wobbly jelly thing. So anyway, now we're in orbit. Oh my god, yes, <laughs> the whole thing wants to turn. Uh, we can start the keythane conversion because we, are, we have power. And uh, we are also limited by what directions we can f you know, deploy these these uh, solar panels, so we find that the 
power is, is being limited somewhat by that, but I think we've got enough to run our converter. Meanwhile, we have to now return to the surface because we're going to have to keep doing this again and again and again, right? This is going to be like, you know, this is going to be powering my whole space industry. So I really need to get good at this. Transfer fuel from this and then... So anyway, you, you might have noticed that this time I have left the Keythane converter and the spare fuel tank behind. And the reason for this, oh, just let us pause and appreciate the view of the space station from uh, from outside through the window. It's always nice to get in the, you know, get in the, the boots or whatever as the... <laughs> Get into a curb in shoes so you can appreciate the pain you put them through. Anyway, yeah, I left the Keythane converter behind this time because uh, I know, having done some, some number crunching, that I can definitely run, I can definitely land and return to orbit, right, using the fuel that's on board. And given that I really am working towards building the whole permanent base thing, I figured that we want to be as efficient as possible. So bringing this thing down and you know carrying the extra mass of the converter and the f fuel tank reduces my efficiency it means that that you know that keythane deposit will eventually be used up and it'll be used up slightly faster if i do it this way so i decided to test it in the original mode that i was designed i designed it for i, I figured it had enough but i was never i wasn't 100 percent sure and uh you know that of course led to the whole disaster which needed the rescue so finally we get to see the keythane miner in its original design and uh, it works pretty well it's actually because it's slightly lighter it's a little more agile and it it feels better i love cruising over the surface like this you always think you're about to hit and then the crater shows up and the crater is huge as well but there we go we're coming in and around 30 kilometers out 25 thereabouts we have to start a start killing our velocity and it's a bit of a there's a bit of a trick here to killing your velocity but not killing your altitude too quickly and of course you want to come right over this thing and there's a little bit of left and right going on here definitely go a little too far again but not so far that it matters i'm just going to pick up a little bit and uh once i get myself in the vicinity, I'm just going to use the landing autopilot to sit me down at ah, 200 meters away. That's not so bad, considering that I was traveling that distance every uh, 0.4 of a second while in orbit. And so we are now deployed and mining again. And there will be much, much more mining on this mission. I'm seriously considering, given the small amount of fuel that I'm actually getting, I'm seriously considering that uh, I should figure out some way to build an even larger and more complicated Keythane miner. Anyway, we're going to cut away from the Keythane operation and go back to my uh, deep space probe operation. And uh, yeah, congratulations to Morgan Mattia, who suggested that I name my four probes after the four winds of Greek mythology. Boreas, Notus, Ereus, and Zephyrus. And I probably mispronounced at least one of those and we'll probably get some comments on it. But yeah, there was a, I was amazed, frankly, uh, at the number of suggestions and the number of really well, you know, well thought out and, I don't know, suggestions that basically pulled from corners of mythology, science, uh, popular culture that uh, I had not even considered. Uh, I, you know, I could name an entire fleet of probes and still not run out with, with what you guys came up with. I was very impressed. Anyway, this particular one, which uh, I have actually forgotten the name of, <laughs> After all that, we're taking that down to Moho, uh, partly because it requires more Delta V than, than anything else, pretty much. And uh, so it's it's going to be going down, and you see that while I definitely have enough Delta V, I don't have particular good timing on this. I just kind of launched them, and I figured that I would abuse the, the launch windows. And there we go. Yeah, worst possible alignment. I, I think... It would be very hard to pick a worse time than that. But it doesn't matter because, you know, it's just a game. There'll probably be some extra uh, maneuvers there to get that lined up. Anyway, launch number 31 happened and it is another crew bus containing seven bold Kerbinauts who will travel out to the moon to continue 
working on uh, making the place a more hospitable place, perhaps trying to get that critical mass of population needed to create a self-sustaining colony, or uh, maybe they're just going to go out there and hang out and play cards with their friends. Who knows? Now, uh, you might notice that uh, those parachutes are uh, accidentally deployed. That was a, an, well, that was an accident. So the the pilot gets out and repacks them just in case, just before, so he doesn't forget before he returns. That would be rather unfortunate, since uh, that is the only landing capability this has. Anyway, launch number 32 is this rather top-heavy module. It's uh, like something like a, an 11-ton uh, habitation module as part of the home mod, which uh, comes from the same people that do the rover, and uh, they've basically built a bunch of uh, colonization packs. Uh, this one specifically is a habitation module with inflatable module stuffs on the side. I don't know if you've heard of uh, Bigelow Airspace, but they are they're basically trying to build inflatable modules to build space hotels ostensibly, but they're actually contracted with NASA, I believe, to look at adding inflatable crew modules to the International Space Station. Uh, the nice thing is that, you know, you can pack these things up really tightly, and then when they get into space, you can expand them out and get a whole bunch more living space, which uh, is nice to have because living in the space station is rather cramped. Um, you know, they have multiple layers so that they don't end up you know, being easy to penetrate by micrometeors or space debris. And apparently, they work at least as well as the International Space Station. In fact, in some places, apparently, they work better. They they launched a module on a test rocket, and it's been sitting up there for a few years now, demonstrating that it can hold pressure for all this time. But anyway, this one is actually going to be going all the way to the moon so that we can deploy... You know, so, well, so we can have a place to hang out and play cards, obviously. <laughs> um, there's also going to be a, a little greenhouse, and you'll see this. Anyway, of course, we're just doing our standard rendezvous uh, system. We, you know, we came up, we realized we were going to be behind the space station, behind Olympus. So we, you know, we basically... Uh, go into a lower orbit so that we catch up and then we find the correct location to adjust to get ourselves on, on an intercept. And it's relatively easy. You've seen this a million times, so I don't know why I'm showing you it again. Um, yeah, I don't know. Uh, anyway, uh, this this is going all the way out to the moon to support the Keithane mining operation and people asked me uh, what I thought of asteroid mining because uh, you know there's planetary resources they they've been making a big noise about how much platinum there is in asteroids and you know it does make a lot of sense you see the thing about asteroids or the thing about heavy metals is that on earth you know the earth melted in the middle right you have it has a liquid core and anything that's heavy any dense materials will tend to sink to the middle they'll fractionate out and uh, that's going to be true of any planet. Now, the thing about the asteroids is that some of those formed into pretty large planetary bodies, you know, a couple of hundred kilometers across. And at that size, uh, it's likely that some sort of, you know, internal heating due to radioactive decay and then fractionation would occur. And by extension, that would mean that, you know, the heavy materials would sink down and you would get some sort of deposits forming. But they're also small enough that when Jupiter stirred up the asteroid belt, that these things get smashed, and uh, these you know heavy metals are are exposed more or less. That's 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 the rough argument. Essentially, because asteroids are undifferentiated, all the heavy metals haven't disappeared to the middle. So you can find something like you know the entire you know ten year supply of platinum in the middle of an asteroid if you can mine it. The problem is, first of all, they're a long way out there. Uh, but, you know, that's a technological problem. They will That will be overcome. There's another slight problem. If you come in with 10 years worth of platinum, you know, how are you going to sell that on the market? Because if you try to dump 10 years worth at once, then you're pretty much going to kill the value of your platinum. In fact, you're going to kill the value of everything. Um... <laughs> So I don't know how the economics of these things will work. Uh, I honestly think that long term, yeah, we will be mining asteroids and stuff like that. It makes sense. Um, 
But, you know, honestly, who knows if it will work out or not. I, I want anything that leads to more space development, I am all for. So anyway, yeah, these guys, uh, they're getting off their crew bus. They're going to be carried out to the moon. The only spacecraft that is really in position to move the whole module is the Mooner bus, which is sitting up here. It's going to do the, the bulk of the work. Uh, it only has that one nuclear engine, but it has enough fuel. We, we're still having to take fuel from this space station, but, you know, hopefully we ha shall have fuel coming the other way soon. Uh, I mean, I could probably do it now, but, uh, I don't know, five launches is starting to, starting to grate on my nerves a little. I mean, one of the reasons why it took, you know, four days to produce this is because I ended up in a situation with, with a lot of boring stuff that you didn't really want to watch. Anyway, yeah, the, the home habitation module is not going to dock. It only has one It only has one port on. It has no RCS fuel. It does have fuel on board, but it that'll be for landing it. Uh, it's actually autonomous. It will be able to land on its own and provide a another home and but refueling is going to be kind of hard <laughs> there it is we'll just get this around you can see this spacecraft below so let's pull in the chart pull in the panels point ourselves down to the 180 position and one of the nice things actually about um, moving this you know docking with this is that it's a long way from the station so the station physics hasn't kicked in so I'm actually getting reasonable frame rates here, and it's it's a lot easier to fly. Once you get within, you know, the 200 meters or so and the, the station physics kicked in, everything just slows down to molasses. Although I, I do think that I've seen some better performance here with the, with the, the you, ah, whatever, with Kerbal Space Program 0.18.4. So yes, coming in, just overshot a little here. That is a very pretty shot, I have to say there, of the, the sun in the background and the docking happen backlit there. I mean, that home uh, station does look pretty large, but, you know, just think about it. It is mostly uh, empty space. It only, I think that the object masses nine tons. It carries fuel for some bizarre reason. I think that the parts haven't been particularly well balanced at this time. But uh, I will take advantage of that mistake. Uh, I will, you know, I'm not using stock in this case, but I am at least not modding the mods. That would be rather uh, cheating. So yeah, just move some crew over to uh, so that this thing is manned. Um, so look, watch this. We're just going to detach that and uh, travel away from it a little. We'll be able to deorbit that thing later. And uh, let's move our, our other Kerbal across. Get him in there. Uh, get him. Get there we go. Get inside. And let's just show this whole thing uh, folding out here so you can appreciate the folding out animation. Uh, you see we have three different sections. We have an airlock section on this side. You can see it just there. Unfortunately, um, despite my best efforts, I can't actually use it. So it shows me that it's there, it shows me that it's empty, but it doesn't appear to be usable, at least in space. So uh, I guess these guys are going to have to sit in the lander can. That means two pilots in each section. Well, nonetheless, let us let us take a look around. I, I thought there might be a space probe. I, I you know I keep need to keep periodically checking the space probes to see which one is in a position to do. A burn to increase its uh, it orbital speed. With the with the ion drives, of course, it takes several passes to build up orbital velocity. Oh look, there's the there's the space center there, huh? Well, anyway, we're going to be burning off towards the moon, picking up as much speed as we can. You can see the one that we did launch there. The probe is just flying away along that vector. So yeah, we're heading off to the moon, and. Uh, it will take us some time to get a spool up to speed. In fact, yeah, it's going to take so long that I'm going to have to cut this episode around here. <laughs> it's almost a 20 minute episode of nothing happening. Uh, but yeah, you guys should send in uh, some suggestions for what I call this base and we'll land it in the next episode. Until then, I'm Scott Manley. Fly safe.